Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe Show and Tell. I'm Jim Rugg. My name's Ed Piscor. I'm Tom Scholey. Special guest in the house. This week we're going to talk a little bit about picture books and, and show off a few picture books. Uh, I started looking at picture books around five or six years ago for a class I was teaching at SVA that was multidisciplinary, so I needed to kind of like look at different visual storytelling uh, mediums and try to find some common language there. Once I started looking at picture books, I kind of fell in love, and I think there's a lot in picture books that we can use as cartoonists. So we're going to show off some books that I like. Uh, we're going to show off some books that are drawn or written by cartoonists, people who we mostly know because of their comics work, and uh, as well as some great designers and, and just some standout books from my collection and from the local library. Top Dodge work uh, of amazing production values on very old books. It really lets you know kind of like where comics place was in the culture when you compare a 1950s comic with a 1950s picture book. Absolutely. Uh, you know, for a long time, I think picture books outpaced comics in terms of design and production. And, and I think comics are catching up, but that is what we're going to see, and that's part of what makes them so inspirational to me now. Yeah, and it's, it's really important uh, to look at influences outside of comics when you're making comics. And, and so uh, this is a form that is adja just adjacent to comics, uh, and and you might even be able to make the argument that that it, it's it actually is is comics, even if it's not necessarily viewed that way. So uh, we'll see that in a few of the examples that we look at. And as you say, Tom, everybody's so quick to talk about film influences, but I rarely hear anybody say picture books. Okay, so let's put these under the microscope. So we'll start with one of my favorites here, the monster at the end of this book, uh, featuring Grover. And the conceit of this book is in the title. So as you start reading this book and turning the pages, Grover is pleading with you to stop because there's a monster at the end of the book. One of the things that stood out to me whenever I came back to this book, this was a favorite of mine as a child. I started reading these again, you know, 30 years after the fact, is the lettering. Very distinct, very graphic. Everything's just tied together. Basically good design. Every cartoonist should have their own uh, serif lettering style, a la like a Will Eisner, Dan Klaus, Robert Crumb. And we'll see some sound effects a little bit later. It's very reminiscent of like a gay Hannah Wilson or something. Very animated. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's very playful. What I would think is perfect for, for a kid's book. There's that gay Hannah Wilson-ish kind of like crosshatch on a thing. And I think one of the things that will be very noteworthy as we uh, check out all these books really is the production values. Like comics, especially back in these old days, such a dirt medium that the production values were so chintzy. And uh, there's like just a lot more labor and TLC built into uh, the picture books. Yeah, you can see Neil Adams has talked about how just having these like color overlays is something that was done in most production art, commercial art, except comics. You know, they were they were decades behind coming to that. And uh, the story, it follows the hero's journey. This <laughs> this monster that he's ready to do battle with or is in fear of, by the end of the book, he finds out that the monster is him. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I showed this book to, uh, I read it to my nephew whenever he was young. And he was basically hysterical as, as the stakes are escalating throughout the book. So <laughs> it's kind of my memory of it as well, really, really ramping up the anxiety in children. Uh, very effective, though, for, I think, for a picture book. So this is another favorite of mine. It's called No. And the conceit here is this is a rambunctious dog that's constantly doing things it shouldn't. And as a result, it's being told no to the point that it thinks its name is No. <laughs> so it's uh, getting into lots of trouble and being reprimanded constantly. I like the choice of not filling in white on the eyes. <laughs> yeah, it's one of the things that we're going to come back to over and over with these is the invent of visuals. It's something that I think comics lagged behind for a long time. And now you're seeing people do everything in comics visually and use all kinds of media. But that was something picture books did for really almost from the beginning. Transparent word balloon. Nice lettering. Yeah, the lettering's really a highlight of, of I'd say, you know, all the whole genre of, of picture books. Yeah, I think graphically there's a lot that cartoonists can take from picture books, but it's not something I hear cartoonists talk about that often. This is uh, M. Sasek, a very famous picture book author that did a series of these books called This Is Usually a Place, uh, often a city like This Is Paris, This Is Tokyo. He also did things like This Is a Journey to the Moon, where it was showing rockets and development. And... One thing I mentioned in picture books is there's so many storytelling elements that are like comics. Here we have an example that's essentially, a, you'd recognize as a nine-panel grid in a comic book. Um, most of 
his pages, you'll see multiple images. Uh, of course, the examples I show aren't that <laughs> way. Great city at night. Um, but several images, using spreads, reading in little pieces. It's very reminiscent of comics and graphic novels, even though no one would look at this and call it a comic. Definitely storytelling that we would see in comics. Because it's such a big industry, it also attracts a lot of different visual artists, including legendary graphic designers like Paul Rand, uh, in partnership with his wife, Anne, who wrote this book. The great Paul Rand, you know his work. Uh, basically every television logo you've ever seen, the mm -hmm. IBM logo, probably UPS. Um, his work's been all over the place. One of my favorite Paul Rand stories is, is uh, he created the... When Steve Jobs left Apple, he created Next Computers, mm -hmm. and, and uh, the way like Paul Rand was such a big willy and had such a such a amazing body of work that the way he worked at that time, you give him two hundred fifty thousand dollars, you ask no questions, he will <laughs> deliver you your logo, and it is what it is, man. You have to have that leap of faith. Yeah. So you see him doing like torn paper and things, very different than what we saw in any comics that would have been in this of this time period. This is probably the early sixties, I'm guessing. Um, 1956, so quite a departure from what you're seeing in comic books at the time. A contemporary designer of Paul Rand's, the great Saul Bass, this is his contribution to picture books. Yeah, Saul Bass is somebody Steranko cites as an influence. Yeah, famous for doing a lot of motion graphics, things like title sequences in movies and movie posters, did a lot of work with Hollywood and specifically Alfred Hitchcock. And you can certainly see... <laughs> Pretty interesting compositional choice. Yeah, every uh, every page turn, uh, he totally changes his approach to like laying out space, where your eye goes, your eye keeps moving in all these interesting ways. Uh, attention to typography. Yeah, this is definitely that era where uh, like typography as an art form, you know, where you'd go, go to a museum and see like just like a bunch of words displayed as an art piece. Yeah, so great use of color, shape. And of course our entry is through comics, so there's lots of cartoonists that have done work in picture books. Uh, this is an example of Richard McGuire, famous in comics probably for doing the short comic here that appeared in Raw Magazine. Uh, it's been expanded since then to a full-length graphic novel, but he's also done several picture books. And like our previous examples, this is somebody who is a graphic artist experimenting with layout, experimenting with typography, uh, production values. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's something you don't see much in comics is punch outs. Well, there was the, the, that uh, one issue of the protectors or the ferret or whatever. Um, maybe they were inspired by a Richard McGuire. Something tells me they were not. Yeah, lots, lots of uh, pushing the production envelope. Um, something you do see occasionally in books like Raw. This is like Gary Panter type. Yes, for sure. Right the there. blue meanies from Yellow Submarine. <laughs> I think he, some of these books he even does upside down uh, lettering, you know, things that would require you to turn the books around as you're reading. So very inventive, very playful. So this is one, uh, The Snowman, that's uh, worth talking about. Um, Scott McCloud mentions this in, uh, in uh, Understanding Comics as like an example of how, you know, children's books in, in, a, lot, in a lot of cases are basically comics and... Um, but they, they, at that point in time, didn't get the respect of comics. Uh, and this was the example he cited, but look at this. And also, adhering to his definition of comics, words aren't a requirement. There are no, no words in this. But this, um, this is you know, pretty close to, to how I approach comics now, these, these compositions where it's uh, you know, a lot of uh, small panels on a page and uh, art that's partially linear, partially cartooning, but doesn't have a hard line is, is you know, told in, in tones. And um, it's, it's got, um, it's got as much story as, as you'd have in, in a, in a graphic novel. It, it, you know, you go through the whole cycle of, of, of birth and, and death with this snowman. <laughs> Traumatic content for a kid. <laughs> Ed, you mentioned comics being a dirt medium for so much of its history. This is probably a good example because clearly no one would call this not comics except for the person producing it if they have a choice because at the time it would have yeah. been i'm sure a much uh, better payout reach a wider audience you know get book placement in bookstores and libraries all because it's not a comic it's a picture book yes yeah, scott mccloud calling this a comic was a bold statement in you know 1987 not now not a bold <laughs> statement now 
Um, this was one of the first picture books that I got hold of via Copacetic Comics and, and a recommendation from its proprietor, Bill Boyshell. This is Mark Allen Stamity. I'm probably butchering his name, but he did comics for Village Voice, um, Washington Post, Boston Globe, New Yorker, and you can see clearly he has the cartoonist, uh, you know, cartoonist style in his blood. Um, you can even see like not exactly word balloons, but these trails of, of words running around, almost like early uh, Windsor McKay or something, where the word balloons didn't really have a standard shape yet. Yeah, you would see this in old tapestries, mm -hmm. in fact. It also calls to mind things like um, Bill Elder's Chicken Fat, where it's just completely covered in marks, uh, hidden gags. You know, it, it would reward a kid or anybody that would just kind of feast on these visuals and continue looking at them. Yeah, and the marks create shades of gray. Absolutely. I mean, this this spread here is like a Goodman Beaver uh, Bill Elder spread. Yeah, and the line work totally in line with any number of cartoonists. You know, he's clearly using mm -hmm. pen and ink. All this amazing textures blows my mind. And this is uh, one of the Sweet Pickles series of books by Richard Hefter. And um, these were advertised on television. So that's that's how... Uh, you know, widespread they were, and and just uh, I, I I bring this one up particularly just just to sort of note the similarity to like Paper Rad, this sort of um, uh, overstimulation of the eyes, uh, uh, bright colors, really simple shapes, very memorable characters. Uh, you know, each each character looking very very different than than the other. Yeah, Paper Rad, I think, is a really good comparison for something like this. Poppy colors and all that. Yeah. That calls to mind Matt Fury. This is a book that he did through McSweeney's, and it is a wordless picture book. So Matt Fury, a cartoonist known for Boys Club and made famous for being the creator of Pepe the Frog. The creator and killer of Pepe the Frog. <laughs> um, I find this one really interesting. First of all, I had not encountered a wordless picture book before this. Uh, since then, I have found several, and it's a very interesting genre unto itself. But in terms of storytelling... There's a very clear left to right progression, and he uses basically three variations. One is the two page spread in this horizontal landscape format, it's just beautiful. The other is breaking that into four panels or breaking it into two panels, uh, which he does in several places. So, very easy to read and to make sense of, um, but very fun. And it's basically just this character going on a night bike ride and some cases biking, looking for his friends to bike with or running into problems and, and trying to avoid too much trouble. So pretty straightforward. I don't know how you read these to children, but very fun to look at. This is Renee French. I don't know what she would be most well known for in comics. She's done several graphic novels like The Ticking. She did a couple of books featuring a character, Bornstadt, that I like. It's kind of monster character. She's been all over the place, very rigorous cartooning. She started off doing the stipple thing, but she would have, all, all of the anthology series that mattered, she would have strips in there. But her, her work is so uh, rigorous, so laborious, that um, you're not going to get a 300-page, uh, you know, magnum opus from, uh, from, uh, from her. But Yeah, kind of a darker set of imagery, a little bit horrific, a little bit scary. She also has, has built up a following through gallery shows and stuff because of that rigorous art style and that, you know, bits of horror, bits of cuteness. And she works extremely small. So a lot of these tones and things are just like sort of natural smudging, maybe not in this particular work, but natural smudging that happens when you're working at like this really small scale. Yeah, it does a lot with graphite, which was, you know, again, now everybody does everything in comics, but she was one of the people that was kind of a forerunner of that in comics, you know, before it was easy to reproduce or before people realized you could reproduce all those tones. So she's kind of at the forefront of that. A cartoonist that I think is somewhat similar in terms of doing adult content in a lot of their comics is Dave Cooper. Uh, in this case, he's working under a pseudonym, I guess, to avoid any potential trouble of somebody Googling uh, you know, his picture book work and, and finding some of his more adult uh, painting or comics work. But this is a great one because he's very good as a colorist in comics as well and also lettering yes and so you get to see all of his skills in this you know if you're a dave cooper fan you would love this so you know people that only know him from comics or from his painting work this would be something to seek out it's really hard to control these kind of brown 
tones and get them to like play off of each other and work and not just become a mess but there it's like very very vivid you, you, your eye follows re really well really good choices yeah to me this is some of my favorite dave cooper work it's it's the cartoony stuff that i like you know he works in a variety of styles um, but this is some of the stuff i find most attractive and probably that production is part of it, Tom. You know, the ability to reproduce these colors and muted colors, uh, somewhat limited. Tom Gold's another cartoonist with that almost genius-like eye for uh, detail and graphic design. This was done by Buenaventura Press, so it's kind of outside of the typical reins of a picture book. But clearly, I think you would call this a picture book. It's, you know, 20 pages on this heavy stock, one image per page set against type and it's in the same exact location so this is the story of uh people at war building an ultimate weapon for this war it takes a long time to construct this robot for war by that point the uh the war is resolved and uh this wor robot never works anyway so then we see the whole life cycle of this from concept to uh you know basically turning into ruins so beautiful yeah This is by Sean Tan. He did a graphic novel. The first I'd heard of Sean Tan, and I think he's a Zurich winner. Mm -hmm. The first I heard of Sean Tan was a book called The Arrival that was mostly a wordless graphic novel. Uh, he's gone on to win an Academy Award for a short film that he basically did everything for. Another guy that's just, you know, super visually accomplished artist. And this is one of the examples of his attempts at a picture book. And I kind of love the collage. Again, an, another example that we haven't seen yet, uh, another approach to graphic design, putting it together, working with different media all in one place. It's becoming more commonplace that comics can be created this way, but this is pretty atypical for comics even today. As you're paging through this, I'm trying to see, is uh, each one of those collages the, just the same collage over as a time saver? No, he's, no. <laughs> he's doing a totally unique collage every page. Yeah, it's, it's very inventive visually from page to page. Layouts change quite a bit. The way text is applied is different from page to page. As you say, Tom, the collages vary. So pretty great to look at. A lot of media. And of course, there are big names that, that venture into children's books and picture books. Uh, Neil Gaiman and Dave McKean. Any fans of Sandman might be interested in tracking down some of, some of their work together. Again, multimedia. This was interesting. I pulled this from my local library. And uh, it was not in the children's section. It was in juvenile literature. And I was talking to the librarian about it. And she kind of flipped through and was like, yeah, we can't really. <laughs> it's a little intense for children. I wonder where they would put Coraline. <laughs> yeah, it's probably in the young adult. But very close to comics once again. You know, like that that's the thing that I came away from once I started looking at picture books was like, if it's not already something that would be identified as comics, it's stuff you could steal and put into your comics. This re uh, uh, reminds me of uh, Kevin O'Neill, what they would say about Kevin O'Neill, where it's like, I, th there's something about the style that's just, that, that's, you know, we got we to gotta put the stamp on, and, and, and it's this, the style rather than, than uh, any, any of the subject matter in there. There's something about the style that's a little creepy. Gaiman's done a lot of picture books. So here's another one, this one with Charles Vess, obviously a longtime cartoonist. This one with Adam Rex, who I think is primarily a children's book illustrator. And this is a series, so, you know, I think it's had quite a bit of success. But you see the lessons, you know, from comics to this. It's not far removed, you know. Two-page splashes, smaller panels. Pretty, pretty easy to uh, make that jump. And a twist at the end, Jane the Fox and Me. This is one of my favorite graphic novels ever. It's by Fanny Britt and Isabelle Arsenault, uh, two French-Canadian creators, primarily known for their work as picture book creators. Uh, they've done several of those together, but this is just a straightforward graphic novel. It's their first one. It's a coming-of-age story about this girl in middle school and her struggles to fit in. Um, beautiful use of color. I think this is a callback to some of the picture books we've been looking at, is that visual uh, inventiveness something we're seeing more and more in comics but has not always been the case and then one of my favorite parts is her little brothers are actually depicted as ninjas because you know they're kind of like monkeys that torture her at home so little twist at the end nice lettering I'm not sure how this was lettered because i think it was originally produced in france in french so i don't know if she was responsible for re-lettering that by hand or not but it seems like whoever did it certainly uh, took their care the publishers certainly want you to. 
speaking from experience. <laughs> they want you to re-letter it yourself. Then here's uh, the the Berenstain Bears. I don't know what universe you guys are from. I'm I'm actually from a third universe where it was called the Bernstein Bears uh, like before we moved into this uh, universe of the Berenstain Bears. But this um, this is interesting to me just to sort of see um, how how like a series that goes on for decades uh, evolves uh, uh, stylistically and story wise. You can see that's that's very different than 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 the cartooning that we see in the in the Berenstain Bears as we know. I remember this image so vividly from, <laughs> from childhood. I've, I've never seen uh, any of this this early stuff, but it reminds me of like whenever you, you know, they keep all the comic strip, like the entire body of work of like comic strip reprints like exist and you get to see like the first Garfield and the first uh, Charlie Brown or whatever and mm -hmm. how they're like off model to what we recognize today. Yeah, even uh, towards the end of this volume, it sort of evolves into like a whole other th side uh, uh, approach where it's it's sort of like a lithography, this very um, uh, sort of painterly and, and and tonal approach, and um, and just try, trying to trying to figure out like what the story is of this ongoing series. It starts where it's just it's one son with no name. In this series, it's actually there. There's like you know they have like six or seven kids, and and, and the the kids. Uh, e like even into the 2000s, the kids still don't have names yet. It's it's brother and sister bear, um, and their their uh, little baby uh, gets a name, Honey Bear. It was a series that that um, to this day is still going on, and and um, it's survived the the original creators, Stan and Jan Berenstain. It's um, uh, it, uh, now now um, th their son Mike has taken over, but there was a there was a transition period where it went from. Uh, Stan and Jan, and then uh, uh, Stan died, and it was it was uh, Jan uh, and Mike doing them together, and then and then Mike eventually t took over. So uh, it's just interesting seeing that that sort of legacy, like you would have in a comic strip, and because it's the the same family, there there is sort of a smoother transition. And just to hit some more, I guess popular uh, picture books that are out there, man. Harold and the Purple Crayon, who hasn't read this when they were a kid, uh, but a lot of people, certainly the kayfabers who come to our channel by way of Wizard Magazine specifically, <laughs> uh, perhaps did not know that uh, the great Crockett Johnson was also a uh, newspaper cartoonist, did a strip called Barnaby for a number of years. Uh, to be specific, Crockett Johnson did the strip from uh, 1942 to 46, Harold and the Purple Crayon comes out in 1955 and uh, what's sort of noteworthy here is the the use of typography as opposed to standard hand lettering which seem to give these old works like even EC Comics uh, an air of uh, respectability and in fact Dorothy Parker was like a huge fan of of uh, this strip and for typography nerds out there if you were curious the uh, the font is uh, italic futura medium yeah, very modern look. Very popular with Wes Anderson as well. And then, of course, the great Dr. Seuss, who we all know and love, had a uh, a comic strip in the old days that lasted all of three months <laughs> <laughs> called Haji, 1935. The first, the first Horton book, which we could probably say is like the first, like, like Dr. Seuss, Came out in 1940, five years after this. So uh, Kitchen Sink put out this great uh, two-volume set, the comic strip Century, that collects like a bunch of stuff. And the entire Haji is in here. And you can see it has all the all the tropes and earmarks of like the great Dr. Seuss, man. Very imaginative, amazing looking creatures. We'll see, I, like, look at that right there. You know what I'm saying? Um, but all 12 strips were, were published in here. And uh, it obviously was built to continue, but Mr. Hurst said, nah, we're done. We're good. <laughs> and then uh, this, I, I don't I don't know if you, if you guys had this when, when you were kids, but um, this, like, t to me is, uh, my, my definition of a graphic novel is, is probably more expansive than, than maybe everybody else's, but to me, like, one, one of the ingredients is is a picture narrative uh, that's lengthy. And here, I mean, this is, this is the Bible, and um, it, it, you know, um, to me, this was uh, like this was like the history of the world. It's like you hear about this thing, the Bible. It's got the cre it's got creation until uh, 
uh, you know, not not too too far in the past, and uh, it just uh, it almost like give it gives the illusion that um, you can find out about anything that happened in in history and page through it. Because of course, uh, as a kid having this book, you're you're pre literate. You're not you know you're not able to read it, so you're just kind of you know finding your way through. And and um, only in like sort of rediscovering this book, I saw like what an influence it had for me in particular. Just the the sort of like tonal. Uh, the tonal approach to drawing, there's just something about it that's that's always uh, appealed to me, and and sort of um, so this is the centerpiece of this of this book is um, is the the picture of Satan, and uh, like every kid I knew who was aware of this book, they were fascinated with this page and and, and a little bit scared <laughs> to look at it, and because it's like you know you get you know uh, you know God God's all interesting and all that, but but Satan you're like particularly fascinated with as a kid because he's 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 the evil. He's the guy who can like creep into your your dreams to kill you or whatever, like Freddy Krueger. But uh, here here he is, and 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 uh, you can actually see a a picture of like the embodiment of of all evil. And this, I mean, this image stuck with me. And and I think without this this page, there's no Satan soldier. Um, I you know this uh, you know he's, he's sort of flying around like like Superman uh, in here, like like a, a a superhero character. So this this was like. You know the highlight of this. Book. Also, I can't imagine uh, Hellboy without yeah. this image. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the Hellboy feet and the horns. The uh, just the aesthetic of like all of this stuff. It's like the uh, like the pulp magazine covers of the day. You know, nineteen thirties, late twenties, all that shit, man. Yeah, and it also it features uh, Norwegian Jesus. <laughs> this is like right out of a background in in uh, Scooby Doo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some apprentice would did some work on that one. Yeah, I'd say this book popularized the the blonde Jesus, the, the <laughs> you know the blonde Jesus who's like thoroughly debunked, uh, you know. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I I chose this one because like one of my. Uh, personal sort of interests and obsessions is is coloring and the proper color in comics and and recoloring and how bad color can uh can uh, destroy a book and this is like a good example of a book uh being uh, reprinted recently recolored and just totally destroyed um the one on the left is is the original edition from from the 70s and if you page through it a little bit um you'll see it it's uh you know like the wizard of oz it starts out in black and white uh, with these, you know, really nice, uh, you know, uh, illustrations with with no color whatsoever, just black and white, and uh, uh, as, this is her fucking horrendous. This is, isn't it awful? And and it, you know, Where as hold on, hold on, okay, sure. Where are we at? But at at a at a point, there's a a transition where magic enters the story, and she makes a wish uh, that like everything she touches uh, turns into candy. And so that's when that's when color is finally introduced. We start to see color, what and it comes in piece of more shit. and more and more. And and look how that's totally obliterated by this book, where there's not there, there's hardly any white in it anywhere. There's there's this a could color from a lot one. of different ways, <laughs> <laughs> like a, like a Judy Bloom teen teen yeah. scene picture book. <laughs> that's a that's a very tactful <laughs> way to say it, Ed. <laughs> and and um it, like all that's uh, obliterated. The sort of the the entry of of magic. Uh, into the story by way of color, very very carefully chosen uh, color. And and beyond that, I mean, there's retooling of the line. Work yeah, the line work is just obliterated. Here, it doesn't exist anymore. These motherfuckers, Starbright books, man, you, should, you need to be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> so that was uh, the the main thing I want to talk about uh, with with this this piece here, because we we see it all the time in comics where uh, old comics get recolored, and it's never as good as the initial printing. I cut promos on uh, Jerry Conway on Twitter once, man, because people were highlighting uh, um, the differences, the disparity in color between the original Masters of Kung Fu and these, like, uh, du jour reprints where, you know, he's poppy color, like, all the stuff that we complain about. And he responded, um, you take what you can get, he says. And I, I just blew up because, to me, that's his fucking career. Like, it's it's total, like... Uh, giving in uh, baseline, like um, no consideration, just like like Harlan Ellison said, man, he hit his deadlines. And I was just like, fuck you, dude. Like, why does it, it doesn't have to be that way. It's that way because, because you don't give a fuck. God damn it, man. I need to get back to making comics. I don't know about you guys. All right, that's good for picture books for now. Maybe we'll show and tell some more in the future. Read more comics.